Have you tried Music to Code By yet? Well, why not? Here's a comment Joe left on the website. This is also great music to mow by. I like listening to music while doing yard work to help the monotony of it seem less tedious. This past summer, I started listening to these tracks while doing yard work, and they worked great! I could let the music play in the background without focusing on it, and it seemed to help me concentrate on getting through my tasks. Thanks, Joe. And you know, now you can download the entire 13-track collection. That's over five and a half hours of music to code by for only 39 bucks. Check it out at musictocodeby.net. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And uh, coming to you today from our various studios on various coasts. <laughs> all the coasts and all the studios. All the coasts. You're on the third coast, right? The third coast. How many coasts are there? Well, you, the Canadian coast. I'm, is the I'm on the left coast. How's that? You know, there's a whole movement along the, the West Coast, both Canada and the U.S., called the Cascadia Movement. I've never heard of it. It's about all us people on the west side of those mountains going, you know, you people are crazy. We're going to go do our own country. Okay. Yeah. Sure. No, no kidding. Right after Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been around for a long time and it's never going to go anywhere, but it's fun to think about. Yeah, it's always fun. Uh, I thought Quebec was going to be the first one to secede. Yeah, it didn't go, that didn't go so well. Didn't go so well, but they no. still want to, don't they? Ah, you know, there's always a separatist movement, but that doesn't necessarily represent the majority. Oh, well. Enough chit-chat. Mm -hmm. Let's get going with Better Know Framework. Awesome. All right, dude, what do you got? Well, uh, my friend and yours, Joel Hewlin, mm -hmm. found this. I think it was Joel found this. Uh, we were, you know, I've been working on this code generator, and Kathleen would be interested in that. I'd be interested to hear what she says later. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, just trying to take as much busy work off of my plate as possible when building a system. And uh, this came up. It's uh, called the Serenity Platform. Nice. Yeah. So if you go to 1433.pwop.me. This is in the Visual Studio Marketplace, and there's a link to their website. Serenity is an ASP.NET, MVC, and TypeScript application platform, which has been built on open source technologies. It aims to make development easier while reducing maintenance costs by avoiding boilerplate code, reducing the time spent on repetitive tasks, and applying best software design practices. So it uses all the bootstrap templates. Um, it, it's all, you know json.net and ajax and all the good stuff that you like and uh the demo is amazing you hmm. can uh, the the breadth of what they do on the front end and on the back end i mean the whole idea is that it generates pretty much an entire application for you nice based on your your data so there you go. I wanted to give them a shout out. Uh, I haven't used it yet, but I plan on investigating further because it looks too good to ignore. Very shiny, buddy. Very shiny. Nice one. So who's talking to us, Richard? Grabbed a comment off of show 1272, the one we did in March of 2016 with Kathleen when we were talking about C Sharp 7, you know, before it shipped. Yeah. And uh, this comment comes from Adam, who says the C Sharp team owes the designers of F Sharp, especially Don Syme, a great deal of gratitude because all of these features, this is the ones we talked about in the show, have been available in F Sharp since its release. It's very doubtful these features would have been proposed for C Sharp had they not been fully baked .NET implementation so readily available. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it's certainly implementation, you know, is a great way to evaluate. Of course, it makes perfect sense. Why spend years of research, development, and testing when you can base your work on existing, fully field-tested implementations? Yeah. I mean, it's a very normal thing, right? We, I know the shows we've done recently on C++, they've talked an awful lot about features that clearly came completely out of C Sharp. Right. Good language features are good language features. And, you know, what was it? Was I think it was Robert Frost who said, immature poets imitate, mature poets steal. <laughs> Was it Robert Frost, really? Doesn't yeah, sound think, like something he would say, but I, I don't, don't know. know. 
<laughs> maybe, maybe it was E.E. E. Cummings, but he would have said it in lower case. Yeah. <laughs> would you be able to tell? I don't even know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I don't disagree with you for a second, Adam. The good ideas are good ideas. And, and the fact that we can write very functional C-sharp these days has a lot to do with uh, uh, the success and, and interest in F-sharp. Yeah. Uh, and so, Adam, thank you so much for your comment. A .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks.com or via any of our social media, because every show is posted to Facebook and Google+. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And please follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. We use two string, two lower on them. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to E.E. E. Cummings. Very All nice. right. Let's uh, bring back to the show one more time uh, for a encore performance, probably her 12th time on the show, I imagine. Something Kathleen like Dollard. She loves to code and loves to talk about code. Along the way, she's been an architect, a manager, a teacher, a writer, a speaker, and hopefully still a fun person. She's written tons of articles, a book, and spoken all around the world. She's director of engineering for ROI Code, previously real, and has videos in both the Pluralsight and Wintelect Now libraries. Catch her this spring at Dev Intersection in Orlando and Software Design and Develop Conference in London. Welcome back, Kathleen. Hi, how you doing? Doing great. I did have to go through the list of how many shows you've done, and there are 13 now, including this one, of you as the guest. Wow, I was wow. almost right. Yeah, right on. And then there's like three or four or five different five or six different panel shows on top of that. Uh, you yeah. were part of the panel, Is Software Development Too Complex, back in 2009. That was a great panel. It was a pivotal was show, fun. I think. Yeah, it was a very big, that raised a lot of stink, that show. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's always fun to do that. Make people think. Well, the issue raised a lot of stink, too. Yeah, you know what it is? When you put Kathleen and Billy on the same panel, trouble. <laughs> yeah, and then you get <laughs> Ruby Buddha causing That's trouble right. in the audience. Yeah. Well, that was the thing, right? About halfway through that panel, the audience took over. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was awesome. Yep. And the only thing that would have been better was a uh, pie throwing contest. <laughs> pie in the face. Yeah, were we in Nashville for that one? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. We were in Nashville for that. Yeah. yeah, my, yeah I think yeah. I, my daughter was six and she was sitting in the front row at that. That was oh. a fun time. Uh, anyway. Hey, before we dive into this, I, I want to throw in one more plug. And this is for a, from a mutual friend of ours, Remy Caron. You remember Remy? Yeah. Yeah, the Dutch conference. So the guy's doing an MBA focused on software development and he's in the middle of doing his final report which is on agile practices and mm -hmm. so he's looking for some agile teams and willing to buy them coffee if they'll help him with his research <laughs> ah he's looking for 150 teams so this is like he's really trying to pick a big sample set of three to five members wow are we going to put a link to uh, a page where you can submit your info Absolutely. And the, and the most important thing I think for this is he's going to share the research with everybody who participates. Wow. So if you really want to get an insight into how your team sort of lines up in this scope of a huge group of teams evaluating Agile, this is really quite valuable. I will put a link in the show notes uh, for this. But if, yeah, if you want to be a part of this, we'd love to collect your data. I smell a 4.0 GPA. Just saying. <laughs> I'm, I can't wait to read it. Honestly, I'm really yeah. excited about it. And Kathleen, yeah. before we get started down the C-sharp rabbit hole, I want to ask you if you've used that Serenity uh, platform that I talked about. I have not. I've not. I've, I've, uh, I, I will tell you that I'm doing a, a lot less generation than I used to because you can do so much now uh, in terms of extensive code reuse with uh, functional approaches and generics and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So we've got to kind of cut down where... Uh, the generation we do is pretty simple, and we're just kind of t 4 in that out and not doing very much fancy stuff at the moment. Yeah, good. It's all about the templates then. It is. it is. Well, <laughs> I think it's all about the architecture underneath the templates. I think mm. that's where the real uh, focus and, and goodness is. And for some of these uh, tools, like the just from the description of the Serenity tool, it's really that it's giving you that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can sit around and create architectures in our head, but it's very expensive and time consuming to execute them in mm. an excellent manner for every single team. Are you using C sharp as well as F sharp for your functional code? 
I'm I'm just using C sharp actually. Oh, wow. um, I I keep having F sharp on my list and things keep coming up, including I had I was sitting down with Matthias Brandywiner, ready to actually sit down and spend a day learning from him, and my machine went south right before I went to oh. a conference. Uh, in it was <clears throat> Dev Intersection. Um, I guess it was last fall when we were in Amsterdam, and my machine goes south the day before. I mean, it will not run Visual Studio. Um, and so it was just a disaster and I didn't get to do any F sharp. So I will get to F sharp. I just really haven't sat down with it yet. You really effing busy? <laughs> I'm effing busy, man. I'm crazy. We've just been moving my dad and now, uh, you know, that's been kind of the big experience, you know, moving your, you know, your folks into assisted living. And so that's yeah. just this huge thing, 7,000 square foot house. And yeah. you can't believe this. I mean, you know, you open a door and there is another storage shed. I mean, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> wow. So we're just about done with that. And so on Friday or Saturday, I'm starting work on my house where I'll be one of the people working and I've got somebody coming in to who knows what they're doing. So I'm just crazy busy. Wow. So you always come with a list of things you want to talk about and it's a long list. So let's just get started. What's new in your world? Yeah, well, I'm kind of, you know, going a couple of different directions today. I'm still talking a lot about C Sharp and Visual Studio 2017 Mm. and how the whole world for us is moving right now. We're in the middle of this big tectonic shift and, um, C Sharp and Visual Studio 2017 are the, the kind of the high point of it because they're just fun. I mean, I, I know the team would like to talk about deep goals and aspirations for each release, but to me, this one is just the one that tweaks things out so sweet. And the reason for that, um, in, in, in my opinion, and, and I'm pretty, I pretty, feel pretty confident in saying this is that 2017 is the first release where the entire dev dev worked the whole release on Visual Studio yeah. and Visual Studio code, of course, but they're, you know, they weren't, you know, they're in the middle of doing the same things we are. They're all in C sharp and are almost all in C sharp or, you know, whatever their language is. And so it's the first time they've actually been dog fooding their tools for the entire release. And I just think that that's really contributed to a lot of really sweet little things like yeah. when you copy a file and you need to rename it, that experience is better. And all these little tiny experiences are so much better uh, than they have been. So that's the light part of it. The heavy part of it is that we're in the middle of this transition um, and the .NET framework will stay alive, but we're going to have core running in, in parallel to that in this whole how do we move a community and it's really not been done well in the past. And I, I think we're set up to maybe have this be very nice and smooth for the like first time ever, as far as I know, in the history of software development. Mm. So we have this enormous change that many people will do. And because of .NET Standard, we're set up to make that change fairly smoothly. And .NET Standard uh, 2.0 is due out in preview Q2 and in full release Q3. And I can talk a little bit more about what it is, but .NET standard is what's going to knit everything together and allow us to transition between the full framework and .NET Core in a sane way, Hmm. we hope. So, (laughs) you know, we have to do it and look at it in the rearview mirror. Uh, But right now, they they certainly have done a lot of work to set us up for that. We've done a few shows on uh, .NET standard and talked about it a little bit. And, um, you know... The, I guess a good analogy for anyone who's been doing .NET for the last 10 years or whatever is uh, PCL. They, they both try to do the same thing, which is, you know, one code base that goes in different places. The difference is the standard is um, a definition that says in order to support this particular version of standard, you have to implement these APIs, Whether whereas PCL is uh, you're, you're picking the common code that is already supported on different platforms. The platform decides what they implement. Right. And, and I think you just said that really well. Um, but I, I want to make it even more clear. And Please. that is that in PCL, PCL chooses a whole bunch of different frameworks and finds the common denominator. Yeah, right. In .NET standard, the platforms are forced to chase the standard yep. and they're forced to conform to the standard. And because one of these is fairly new in .NET Core, we can do that right now. Mm. And so it's a reversal of roles. Yep. And that makes all the difference because we're not looking at a common denominator. We're looking at a big set of features. Well put. And it's awesome. And, and I think it's just going to be more usable. I mean, folks run into this issue with PCL where when you want to add more platforms to your app, you just take a beating. It is incredibly hard to get to that common denominator after an initial deployment. Mm. Right. Although I will also um, add that in the standard world, and I, I don't think this works against PCLs, 
There's also a great compatibility tool. Um, and I can't think of the name of it. Maybe you guys have it on the tip of your phone. I think it's a .NET compatibility tool. And you can just kind of click off the things that you want to target, and it will tell you uh, what's not going to work and what is going to work. And that's particularly important right now. If you're asking the question, do I need to wait for .NET Standard 2.0, or can I adopt the current .NET Standard, and if, which is not as complete? And so you can ask that question of this tool looking at your own code. And for us, we got bid on iQueryable. So uh, that was a pretty big one. And we will be waiting until Q2 to go to that. Right. It it does feel to me like Core 2 and the .NET Standard 2 is going to be the big one. Like this yes. is this is going to be a big whammy. Everything's going to be better. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I'd love for us to be able to jump on things sooner. But I think the folks that are jumping on it right now, um, they're great. And if they're doing some very specific scenarios, they'll, they'll be fine. Um, but in terms of the breadth of all these, all these different things people do, uh, across the, the .NET ecosystem, that's going to start getting empowered with, uh, standard 2.0 and core 2.0, of course, backing that. But you know, a few things will have to chase it a little bit. We got to get UWP, you know, fully engaged and, you know, everybody's head in that direction, but will it all just be there in Q3? I don't know. I think that ASP.NET Core, .NET Core and .NET Standard will be well aligned, but I don't know about some of the peripheral things. Uh, I found an MO Landworth's bit on the .NET framework compatibility diagnostics. Yeah, that's it. And that's yeah. a sweet little tool for anyone who hasn't used it yet. Um, highly recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll include it in the show notes. That Thank guy, Emo, he's, he's smart. A smart oh, guy. gosh, he is. He is <laughs> so smart. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my. So, you know, a year ago, we were talking about C-sharp 7 is going to be shiny and new. Now it's been a year. It's been pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, it's only been in full release for a month. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, guess that's by true. the time the show comes out, it'll be two months. But yes. Yeah. Um, so it's not been, you know, it's it's pretty new still. And but we've known what was going to be in it. And that's a really big difference than the yeah. past. It was no there was no surprises uh, during the launch event or almost no surprises during the launch event. We knew yeah. what was coming. Which is fantastic um, because there's been so much feedback along the way about just little, you know, let's just make it smooth and sweet. And right. um, there's some things that they did without much community feedback and stuff that had huge community feedback in it. So uh, it all comes together. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to be unhappy. We It feels like it finally, you know, we got all pieced together. Although in a lot of ways, it's it reminds me of the old .NET 1.1. Sure does. You know, where we finally got a decent set of tooling around this early version of uh, of the framework. Yeah. I think in a way that, you know, it's, it's the first, you know, usable um, around core. But I think on the, the, the experiences that we're used to doing, um, I think that they've done a good job of taking – both workflows, you know, things that we do in the, just annoy us, like that file rename thing. I mean, that just has been annoying <laughs> since the beginning yep. of time. Sure. And the whole, uh, you know, you, you do the as operator to say something as customer and the next line of code is if, mm. you know, X is not null, that goes away completely. You'll never write that code again. So there's really sweet stuff like that, that it's easy to say, oh, yeah, we do that. Mm. And there's also really good stuff around things we don't do yet. And profiling is right now the biggest one of those. Um, I'm hoping they make some more strides on logging. Richard, I know you're like with me, like, oh, my gosh, we're not logging enough. But the profiler that comes out in Visual Studio 2017 um, is actually buried in diagnostic tools, and that's probably the way they talk about it. But there's just a tab there that says CPU something. CP and, and if you click on that tab, it tells you, you there's a button that you push that button and you start sampling. Now, if you think back of all the just contorted ways we've right. had to go through three modal dialogues just to get profiling started right. um, and set up sampling and answer questions, now it's just one button. You just push the button and you're sampling. Now, you can adjust it and tweak it if you know what you're doing. But if you just want to get normal profiling data, that's all you have to do. And then the result shows you a hot path. And then it also shows you a traditional tree. Um, and even in the tree, they've changed the language from away from inclusive, exclusive into, I, I think it's uh, elapsed in, uh, in self or something like that. So you wind up with this experience that even if you've never profiled before, you can probably get through this and find out whether you have some particular problems. And then they layer on top of that, that graph, which always makes me crazy. I don't understand the graphs, but the graphs are going to show you the garbage collection. So oh, if you have, 
Yeah, yeah, that is great. Yeah, yeah. Set up to force garbage collection to go nuts. And it's beautiful. It's just all these little tiny triangles. Mm. And uh, so it's right there in front of you. And so if you have a garbage collection problem, you're going to see it. And more importantly, all those times that's just in back, nagging in the back of your head. And you're saying, oh, people say it's never a garbage collection problem, but I don't know. You can just look and see that it's not. <laughs> so. yeah. uh, I, I'm reminded of her on the run ass side. We have a haiku. <laughs> uh huh. It's not DNS. It's never DNS. It was DNS. <laughs> That's yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, well, you know, on the, on the profiling side, it's generally true most of the time. And then, uh, and then of course, if it is, if you do, uh, um, and I just hear Jeffrey Richter's voice telling me this, <laughs> um, that there is no such thing as a GC problem. There may be an allocation problem, but there is mm-hmm. no such thing as a GC problem, that it's always your allocations. So it's always creating the memory pressure that causes the garbage collection right, in okay. today's world. Now, when we first started out, garbage collection could be blocking at awkward times, but it's, t- it's tuned so well right now that I doubt anyone's going to have a problem that they could fix by tuning GC. Well, that's a, I'm saying that too strongly because there are some side cases, but they have to do with like large object heap collection still and some things like that mm. that are real side cases. This episode of .NET Rocks is made possible in part by Windows on the Google Cloud platform. You may not know this, but the Google Cloud platform supports Windows Server 2008, 2012, and 2016. It also supports SQL Server versions 2012, 2014, and 2016 standard web and enterprise editions with high availability. You can deploy your ASP.NET Windows apps to Compute Engine or your ASP.NET Core apps to App Engine or Container Engine. That's Google's hosted Kubernetes environment. .NET and .NET Core libraries are there for all 200-plus Google.com and cloud services in NuGet, led by John Skeet of Stack Overflow fame. But what about Visual Studio integration? Oh, it's there. You can use Visual Studio to manage your GCP resources and deploy your existing apps. You get stack driver logging, error reporting, and tracing support for .NET and .NET Core. PowerShell commandlets for GCP, which run on Windows and Linux. And a great set of partners to bring your Windows and .NET workloads to GCP, including Capgemini, Nudesic, and Magenic. So go to gcp.netrocks.com and get your free trial today. Do you think the, the new profiler and all of these things, uh, some of these things anyway, are made possible by Roslyn? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not sure which ones are, actually, but um, the It just seems like style, magic, you know? Yeah, it does. No, no, the magic is, is really there. So uh, these code fixes, which are kind of all over the place, like the one to rename the file or to, uh, to pull uh, classes, yeah. if you have a whole bunch of classes in one file, to be able to pull them into separate files or uh, change to expression body members if you're not using them, or one people should really get excited about if you have old code and you've got string dot format all over it, hmm. all you have to do is position on that and hit control period and that changes over to string interpolation. Hmm. So, you know, there's all these things that that's all Roslyn. Now, whether the profiler is Roslyn, I'm just not sure because that's got such a runtime component yeah. that um, Roslyn may be unrelated to that. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to tell, but I, I guess I feel like it's everywhere. Um, well, it's everywhere up to the, up to the end of the compiler. <laughs> so if it needs to go back to source code, yeah, it's going to look back there. And so when it's doing things like, um, like showing you the code, because the profile actually shows you the code, um, that it's gotten its hot path and things. And when it's going back and finding that code, that would be Roslyn. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I actually responded to a comment. We did a show recently, uh, talking about writing a, a, a scripting language called Chai script, which is actually C as a scripting language embedded in a C app. And of course, Roslyn does the same thing for C sharp apps. If you want a scripting language, you can use C sharp. Well, well, yeah, uh, absolutely. And it would be awesome. You know, in, in a way that's kind of like almost to me as a bit of a, of a non issue because it's like, wait a minute, isn't that what Unity has been since the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> so. you're not, you're not wrong. It's Unity is really <laughs> a, a scripting platform using C sharp as its language. Right. Right. And it is behind. I mean, you know, I understand that they're working on getting to, I think they're going to jump to seven, but it's at least six. Uh, but it is, I believe the Unity release is still at C Sharp 4. Yeah. I think. Well, I, I always had the sense they did their own implementation the same way the Xamarin guys once did until Roslyn came along. Right, right. Well, in, you know, I don't know m- much about what goes on inside of that that project. Unity is another one of those things, which is on my radar, like F Sharp, I want to go spend a month, you know, kind of, 
immerse all my free time, if I can find some free time, into that. And I just haven't gotten to spend that time yet with Unity. I'd love to be able to make a game. I think that'd be fun. I'm, and this is another one where you, I think a lot of people think, well, when is Microsoft going to buy these guys? When is it just going to be part of the suite? Well, you know, they're working closer to with it. And, and I don't know whether they're actually going to, you know, get um, uh, fully engaged. There. I guess I, I thought I thought they had some ownership already, but maybe I don't, maybe I'm completely wrong on that. Yeah, they might be invested in some capacity. And, and then, you know, acquisitions don't come out of the blue. It always starts with a close partnership, right? You think about how close Xamarin was working with Microsoft coming into that eventual acquisition. It's, you know, it's not like you, you literally are walking down the street and go, hey, I think I'll buy that company. It's like, no, we were friends. We were working closely together and finally it made more sense to do it this way. You know, I think that's very true on most successful acquisitions. I think mm-hmm. if you go back and you look at some of the, you know, astoundingly bad acquisitions that have happened, <laughs> uh, that may not be true. <laughs> so I think it's a good, like a, a good way to go about your acquisition. So you yeah. improve your chances of success. It's an interesting gauge. I just, I, the, the other question you got to ask is what would bringing Unity into Microsoft do for Unity? Like, how would it make it better? Like, I feel like Xamarin has gotten better by being part of Microsoft. Well, you know, I think for the same reasons Unity would, because uh, I think that having the, uh, you know, the coherent support from mm-hmm. a, that entire, you know, dev div rooting for you, I think it's a pretty powerful thing. I think it's been a huge help for Xamarin. Yes. Um, I think that there's pieces inside Xamarin that would have been challenging. They might have done it, but it would have been challenging and it would have been challenging to do it as smoothly and as integrated as it has been. So, um, yeah, I think it'd be cool if, if that happened. I think it'd be just as much fun to go play with it out. You know, in Unity land, I just haven't gotten over there. So many things to do, so little time. What are you spending your time on these days? Oh, well, other than moving my dad and working on my house. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so You do some work, what, too? <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know, I, I have this, uh, this this job, and I have some flexibility. Uh, I actually work for less money, so I have flexibility about some of what I do. Right. Um, and that lets me go to conferences and things. And on that front, I'm getting ready for, for a really fun spring because in London – I redo the uh, the workshop that I've done for Dev Intersection and some other places that is that I call I will make you a better C sharp programmer. Yeah, I love that t- workshop. It's great. You know, when I first started that, I was really intimidated that somebody's going to walk in and go, "You did not make me a better C sharp programmer." <laughs> you know, I was scared about that. It hasn't happened. I want <laughs> so, my money back. <laughs> no, you know, I don't care about giving somebody their money. That's it's just a matter of. Of, you know, really, do you really know this stuff? And, and some of it is like, like this year, I've got this thing about every time I go on stage and probably most time I go on a podcast, I want to remind people, stop using anything but decimal. Do not use floats. Do not use doubles. Unless right. you know for an absolute fact, you need that performance. Now, yes, you could talk to me for five minutes or talk to somebody else for five minutes and say, oh, well, I know I will need it. But those are rare. I mean, we're talking full on engineering or financial modeling. Uh, we're talking graphics. We're talking something yeah. where at the end, you're rounding to like two or three digits and the sure. rest of it doesn't matter. Well, then fine. It doesn't matter. Use use a floating point. Mm-hmm. But that difference in performance, you can't find in almost any app. And you really toss out your predictability from a human standpoint. It, the, and the, 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 you do lose um, actual accuracy as you do the, the transition from base 10 to base 2 and back, which you have to do to display it and to get the value. Uh, but other than that, base two is completely correct inside of base two. It's just that they're different and they're different than what humans expect. So there's just kind of at this point, not much reason to ever be in a double or a floating point except niche cases. And, uh, there, there's that. I mean, I talk about things as simple as that. And then I talk about, you know, some about async and some other things. So I finish, I'm going to do that one, uh, in London. It's possible it's the last time I do my original, I will make you a better C sharp programmer. Because at Dev Intersection in Orlando, I'm doing a brand new workshop, which is, uh, it is, I will make you a better C Sharp program 2017 edition, the functional edition. And I forgot how we put all those words together in the, <laughs> in the title, but they're all there. <laughs> Believe me, it flows smoother than that on the website. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm going to focus there on, uh, on, on how methods work and, and, you know, some, some basics there. I am going to touch again on async because I've got a lot of concerns about how we're uptaking the async ideas. And then I'm going to also show you how to write less code by using uh, functional techniques. 
And that's right. going to be the workshop that, you know, as I return places, I can't just keep doing the same workshop over and over again. Although I'd love to talk you into the fall, letting me do both one before and one after the show so that we can see what the interest is. Because I really think that first workshop still has, has a lot of people should still come to it. It's, they're going to learn a lot. I, I don't disagree because, you know, I feel like you get full value of that workshop if you get one good idea, one thing that you incorporate day in, day out, and you give us dozens. Like, it's almost too much to take in. It is too much to take in. And the reason that is, it part, and, and I feel bad about that, but as I think through and I work through teaching on that on that workshop and this big claim and and people walk in there with a big range of backgrounds. Now, it's not a beginner's workshop. It's definitely intermediate and up. But in order to have something, you know, maybe maybe five or ten things mm. that an advanced programmer is going to walk out with, I got to give out a hundred because I don't know which ones. Yeah, what do you missing. already know? And so, so in order to make all of that work, then I know I've got too much of the intermediate programmer that comes in, and I just hope that they're able to grasp the, the big concepts and, and not worry quite so much about some of the little tiny details. Like in the original workshop, I talk about GC. And okay, that's great. But at the end of the day, what do you need to know about GC? Which is that you care about second generation GC and you want a way to just kind of check it off and that it's really not your problem. And so, you know, it's, it's not like it's a big idea, but I do go through a lot of details that an advanced programmer probably wants to know um, in order to get to that. Yeah. Well, I know for a fact that your evals come back great and that the people that see your talk say it's gold. I mean, it really is valuable stuff. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to work on that and to, uh, it, it's just, it's really a lot of fun because I also make people talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, because <laughs> as we're learning as programmers, uh, collaboration is our best learning tool. Right. And whether that's in your team or whether that's at a workshop or whatever, so I ask people, hey, what do you think happens here? And most of, most of the time I do it through a test, so it's very black and white what the result will be. And I ask people to express their ideas verbally. And you can do this with somebody in your own team. And, and it, it's a fantastic learning experience. You, you have a, some sort of a question. And instead of just immediately running a test and finding out what the answer is, think about why you think it might be X or Y. And then write the test to tell you whether it's going to be X or Y. And if it's complicated and you don't understand the answer... That's that's for Stack Overflow or get in touch with somebody who you think can can help you with that. Absolutely. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Uh, it must be that happy time again. Yeah. It's time to read a new joke that I wrote using the .NET Rocks humor standard level 0 0.001. <laughs> is that a beta? <laughs> Sh should I read it again? It's a preview. We don't do betas anymore. <laughs> I, I should it's should I read it again? It? <laughs> it's actually time to give away D experience subscription to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. Become a UI superhero with DevExpress UI controls and libraries, and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an Office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. Learn more and download your free 30-day trial at devexpress.com slash superhero. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner, Richard, is Craig Myers. Congratulations, Craig. Golf clap for you, sir. Yeah. And Craig just won the D experience subscription from Developer Express. That's a big pile of awesome from our friends over there just by being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you don't know what that is, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big get free stuff button, answer a few questions and join the .NET Rocks fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors and every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of that fan club. But you have to sign up to win. And Kathleen, it's been a while since you've been on the show. Maybe what you want to buy with $5,000 has changed. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure last time, you know, because I think I was just in my house, uh, it was going to be stuff for the house. And, th and that's still pretty high on my list. But the other thing, it, it's, it's kind of silly, but... 
Um, I've got a 2007 Subaru. And now my last Subaru and I parted ways on a very bad, it was more of a divorce than an actual anything <laughs> oh. else. <laughs> so I swore I'd never have another Subaru and I, I got one and it's used. Does love make a Subaru a Subaru, Kathleen? No, gosh, not, no, but <laughs> no, it's really solid four wheel drive and ice handling that makes a Subaru yeah, a Subaru. No it's not love. So anyway, um, I have a Subaru. Uh, 2007 Subaru and uh, just put a battery in it last night. That did not cost me $5,000, but I do want to, tr- I would trick trick out the sound and the backup camera because I don't have Bluetooth and I don't have a backup camera and I don't have that like, electronics and in the car is fine. You know, it's, it, we, it has their limited slip differential and all the stuff that the internal combustion engine car, it's pretty, I think, that, you know, 2007, 2010, I think we kind of reached the pinnacle uh, except for self-driving, and I'm not quite ready for self-driving. I will be. I'm going to be yes, excited, sir. but right. I'm not quite there yet right now. So other than self-driving, which, of course, right now costs you a boatload of money, um, I think we're kind of hit the pinnacle and that there's not a whole lot more in your average 2015 car than there is in your 2010 or 2007 car. Now, right. the, 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 the car people are going to send all sorts of nasty stuff to the show now. But, um, but anyway, I got this 2007 Subaru, and it could really use getting tricked out with the comfort features, backup camera, oh, tricked out sound system, nice. and, uh, and Bluetooth. And I'd have, probably have a hard time spending a full $5,000 on that, but I'd have an awful lot of fun trying. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, Kelly has a Subaru and she loves it. Yeah, so I'm about, I'm probably going to sell my big old truck. I got a, a 1985 uh, three quarter ton giant truck and it really needs a paint job among other things. And it's really not worth the paint. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I picked up a trailer last night. I bought a trailer for my dad. And so as soon as I trade my uh, Hyundai Veloster and my uh, old GMC pickup truck, uh, I'm going to get something that can tow that trailer and just kind of be done with trucks for a bit. So. Cool. Not worth the paint. I don't think it's worth the paint, man. You know, <laughs> it's a big truck. It's going to take a lot of paint. Yeah. It's going to be expensive and it's got a little rust and stuff. So it, it's going to, it would, to do it right would be an expensive paint job. So Kathleen, back in the days when DNR TV was actually a show, we did a show with John Skeet on uh, underneath uh, async await when async await just came out and he reversed engineered it you know with c sharp code and he's just amazing oh, but yeah. uh, is there anything new in in uh, async await land i mean it just works and it works so great yeah it works so great if you get it right um i'm just really concerned about a lack of understanding i think that the people have and i keep running across these uh, really smart people that are are just they're just asking questions that either say, okay, let's sit down and talk about the meaning of life, you know, which is like, why does async have to go everywhere? And I want to do sync over async, or I want to do async, sync over async, or async over sync. Mm. And any of those questions say, well, well, you're kind of missing the point um, of how async works and what we're trying to do with it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then there's another set of questions, which just comes up that are random. Uh, I was working with somebody on a Stack Overflow post where – they were doing, they were hitting, uh, entity framework to list async and complaining that it was twice as slow as, uh, entity framework to list. Now, huh. the problem with this is that's kind of a wrong number. Um, so it's slower. It should be slower, but it should be slower. Like if you can measure it maybe as high as 10%, maybe. Mm. And then there's another set of problems that have to do with things like swallowing exceptions or something like that. Um, that can be weighed like five or 10 times. And I really struggled to find out what could possibly be about two times different. Mm -hmm. And then I finally got the raw numbers. And what happened in this test was that they did 10,000 iterations against a database that was with two list async and with two list. Okay. They 10,000 iterations and the difference was 10 seconds to 20 seconds. Wow. Now, what you need to do to think about this problem is to say, okay, all of the work to get ready to do the this async stuff, that happens once. And it doesn't matter if what you're doing is super fast or super slow. That's going to be the same amount of time. So what they've done is they they must have been running against a local database. Uh, somebody may have even been caching this stuff. But their, but their actual result was about one millisecond. And so what happened was because their actual – it actually takes the two-list part of it, the going to Entity Framework and back – took about one millisecond. Now they load all of this async stuff on top of it, and all of that takes another millisecond. And you're like, 
well, okay, if you had something that took a normal length of time, a tenth of a second, half a second, those kind of numbers, now that millisecond's completely lost. Mm. You're not going to even be able to measure it. And, and that's just, that's just we don't think about async in a, in a holistic enough way yet. And I don't quite know how we get a model out there where people are able to do that. I know folks are trying, but mostly they're taking John Skeet's approach, which is let's rip it apart and make sure you understand what task means. Yeah. And I'm not yet convinced, at least for me, that that's the direction. I mean, I'm kind of an outside-in person. But doesn't just good measurement and A-B testing, well, isn't that you know, the answer, right? I mean, it works faster if you do it this way than that way? Yeah, so if they were working against their against real code, they might have gotten it that way. Um, but as it was, they were still in design phase, and mm-hmm. they were, you know, just basically saying that they didn't want to use async because it was so slow. Huh. And you know, in it, and it's not. It is slower because it's always going to take more time to switch out what you're doing. Um, but on a server, which is what they were looking at, they're still going to get better throughput because they're in the real world. They're going to take, you know, a hundred milliseconds to make that call to Entity Framework. Let's just say they use five or ten milliseconds in order to fully switch out. I, you know, ASP.NET is, you know, getting itself all request out, request in, all the stuff it's doing. You still have ninety milliseconds back. Ninety percent of that total gets back to you to go handle other requests. Mm. So, you know, you're going to get better throughput with that approach, assuming that you're not running against a local database sitting right there that can give you its answer in one millisecond. Right. In which case, you should never use async. Sure. Yeah. I mean, didn't we have the same problems with threading, you know, doing threading manually, which was, you know, there's overhead for context switching, there's overhead for using a thread, there's only so many threads that you can use. So, you know, assigning one thread to one, let's say, user is never a good idea, you know, things like that. There, I had to learn that the hard way, you know. Yeah, and and I think that we've kind of stepped back from threading a lot with async because async doesn't require threading, so we can right. step back from that problem. But sometimes on a server, I'm not sure that just running, you know, having a few extra threads running and having them go silent and somebody else come in and skipping async, you know, may not be a terrible idea for some kinds of websites. Um, but you know, the the whole, I mean, the whole latency versus throughput question is one that we don't have to think about all the time. Um, and in that profiling stuff makes right. it easier to watch latency, but not so much, uh, throughput. And so I think as we, as we get through the next couple of years, I'm really hoping that we get a better general model and understanding for async because it really troubles me how much async, bad async, really bad async I see in the wild. <laughs> Do you have any ideas on ways to improve the model so that people will use it in a more intelligent way? I can tell you I'm working hard on that. I'm thinking a lot about that and I'm starting to talk to some other people. Um, uh, Jeremy Clark is, talks about async and he takes on uh, the task out approach and, uh, that may be right. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't know that I'm correct that we kind of want to think about a new model. Um, uh, but I just, you know, this ability to step back and say, you know, this is what a pipeline looks like. It has to be a sync pipeline or an async pipeline. You can't switch back and forth. Those kinds of big ideas are the, are the ones that, you know, uh, like a small model is important in understanding what task is doing, but also when you step back, what's the big picture of how this works? And right. and I'm just astounded by the people that I talk to about this. And, and you know, I, I'm not going to mention anybody's name, but just absolutely astounding people go, yeah, I'm in that camp of I'm not sure I understand it. Um, and then, of course, we have the John Skeets and the Stephen Tabs and the Stephen Clarys of the world that are just amazing at understanding the ins and outs um, of this all. But you know, uh, much as I, yeah. I love, uh, everything Stephen Taub ever wrote, his best, the best post he did on async was the, uh, the one where he was mind reading, uh, yeah. on async problems. And, you know, it was very, it was not as deeply technical. It was a much lighter, this is a funny post. I can figure out what's wrong with your application by the question you just asked me. <laughs> yeah. That's, that was fun. <laughs> but that speaks more to just how recurrent certain classes of problems were. Mm-hmm. They still are. I'm yeah. not convinced. I'm not. I mean, I see such a small data set that I think even mentioning what kind of percentage I feel like I see in terms of code in the wild or questions I get and the implications of the code those questions come from. Um, we have a lot of code out there with async in the wild where it's not done right. right. Um, and I think the most common one is that people do a bunch of await and async and they have a task in hand and then they say task dot result. Well, they've just done all this async work and then stopped themselves and they didn't return up to a point that was able to actually do something else. They've frozen their thread at a different spot mm-hmm. than they right. would have th- frozen their thread if they'd never used async. 
And yeah. so I don't think people get that. Um, and so there, there's these really basic things. Uh, and in the question of, you know, I don't want to use async because it goes everywhere. Well, async await is really awesome for, uh, it's best suited for, you know, UI. I mean, that's really where it shines, isn't it? Yeah, you know, that's a different world because, you know, and, and just to be really clear, on a server, you care about throughput versus latency and balancing that when you're thinking about async. And there's other things that can happen that may help you a little bit and all that. Once you go over to uh, anything desktop, anything UI on the on that side, and you have a message loop that's running, in any place right that, there, the purpose of async is to get you back responsive for your user. Yeah. And that is just sweet. There, There's just like, that just works. That's yep. just sweet. Uh, right. The only issue is making sure you get back to the right thread, but async and wait even makes that easy because by default, it goes back to your UI thread and you don't even have to worry about that. Shouldn't we talk through a good example of, a, of an async await implementation on the server side? Yeah, that sounds, uh, so, so that sounds great. Um, I'll start and you guys can, can jump in here. So we have a MVC application, uh, that is got a call coming in from the browser that's asking it for some data and displayed in a, in a UI. And so the first thing that that has to do after it goes through its pipeline and sets up its, um, its internal stuff, it does all of its binding and you're ready to go is probably going to be to go out and get the data that it's going to display. And that data can easily be, uh, you know, a tenth, half a second. It can be real time to go and get that. And then if it, if it's, it can be even worse if you need to get multiple things or you, you actually are going over a fairly, you know, long connection or to a public site or something like that that can have a really long latency. Right. Well, and these are the scenarios that I've seen, right? It's like, I need to compose this data set for you and it's coming from four sources. So rather than serially request each source and wait on each one before I render to you, I request all four at once and whatever order they come in and it's fine. I, I just compose the set. I still need them all, but the net time is going to be lower because the requests are simultaneous. Yeah. Right. And, it, and in that case, you always win. So, yeah. um, in that case, if they're, if, if, unless one of them is predominantly longer, you won't, you know, you're going to win quite a bit. Because you're going to use when any or when all, depending on whether mm-hmm. you need all of the results or just right. any one of the results. Um, but to do that and to get back, so while you're waiting, you, you can do something else is yes. you need to tell ASP.NET, Hey, I, I'm, here's a task. And when this task completes, you know, start me up again. And that's right. why I can come back up on another thread mm-hmm. is because you return that to ASP.NET. And the first thing ASP.NET does is it waits. Okay. It waits a small amount of time. Because it doesn't, either some scenarios are really important where that data is immediately available. And the simplest one to think about is that you're caching. So, right. mo- so you, sometimes it might take you a second to get that data, but then you've got it and it comes back lickety split. And so it does have a very, very short wait that says, is that data already available? And then it says, yep. no. okay. Now it takes the whole request and it, it takes it off and it puts it, it just, takes it off. I mean, you could think of it as serialization, although I think that's probably not very technically correct. Mm. And it takes the whole request, bundles it up, and completely releases that that the thread. It like, can handle another request. It can completely, uh, you know, forget that it ever started all those things. Then when they come back, you, it, the thre- something gets, you know, reconstituted, the request gets put back together, and now it can work on the, on the same request that it was working on earlier. That's all magic. It was just yeah. fantastic that it happens. It's just, it kind of feels like magic. So we forget it's happening. And right. that's why we need the async at that MVC or web API controller level. And then we need it at any intervening levels to pass that message all the way down to any framework. So any framework passes back a task and then each of your layers each pass back a task. And then you give a task back to ASP.NET, which is what it needs to do its magic. So that's why the question of, I don't like, I don't like, uh, using async because you have to use it everywhere. Mm. Well, in your pipelines, top to bottom, yes, you have to use it everywhere because you need that task and mm-hmm. you need to give it back to entity for, um, sorry, to ASP.net so right. it can do its magic. Yeah. I think it's, I think the most challenging scenarios for async away are the ASP.net scenarios. Like it right. makes so much sense on any smart client. Yep. 
Right. And even any stateful backend service, for that matter, it's not that big of a deal. But the transient nature of a web page request makes it substantially more challenging to use. Well, and in the other news here, I mean, the other thing here is that it also means that it's not as important. So um, if you're on a desktop, kind of anything with the message uh, loop that's going, anything where your users mm-hmm. are waiting – um, for that, you know, they're going to make another click and you're going to handle it. Always, always, always use, use async and await unless you really understand a reason not to. But on a server, I'm no longer convinced that servers by de- default should do this. They will have better throughput. But if mm-hmm. you're going to screw it up, you're not going to help yourself. You got to right. do it right. And yep. if you're not doing it right and you're not, you know, async top to bottom and you're not, uh, avoiding using dot result unless there's some weird, weird situation and, and you've got, you know, if you're not doing those things correctly or you don't understand that a loop runs those sequentially instead of side by side or, or, or these kinds of things, you're making such big mistakes that you're not going to have won from using async. So this is what I'd love to change. I'd love to be back where I was really comfortable seeing by default use async and wait and use this set of guidelines and it's all going to be good. I'd just like my backend services to, to be architected in such a way that I don't have to use async. On the back end, I mean, isn't that the beauty of you know f- serverless computing? Well, maybe, but you know, aren't you? St- I mean, maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe by the time you get out there, and I guess I haven't thought about it enough that way. Um, but maybe if you can just spin up an infinite number, and you're only paying for CPU, so you don't care except when you're active. You don't care when you're silent. Right. Uh, then maybe it's just fine. As long as everything responds in a handful of milliseconds, everything's fine. As soon as something is going to take longer. Right. Mm-hmm. And, or it's just uncertain. Like, right. you, you think about that four call scenario and none of them are required. So they're all optional. If you do this serially and they're failing, that's going to take forever. Right. But that might be a signal to use a, a queue, you know, and just get right back to the user and say, okay, it's going to take a little time. Just uh, we'll notify you when it's done. Now, that, I think, is a really interesting spin on this, Carl, is to go further down the path of, if you're really unconfident with this, why aren't we just doing this all with message passing? Right. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. And there's certain things that we do um, that we are just so addicted to giving our users immediate feedback. And sometimes that's us because we are the kind of people that want to know it was finished. Yeah. And our users are often not. And, you know, they're like... 99% of the time it's right and the other 1% you're going to send me an email, I'm good. That's just fine. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy, you know. So um, I, I think that there is a lot of traction, particularly around uh, if you have resources that you don't have a lot of control of their uptime or you know you have problems with their uptime, right. then going to a queue, of course, is very obvious. But there's a lot of other situations where we don't jump to a queue. And I do think that there's some issues around patterns around queues people can be confused about as well. But overall, I think the patterns are actually easier than 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 I, I didn't think this at the beginning of async and await. I actually thought this was going to be easy. Mm. But as I've seen more and more code that's problematic, I'm not like, you know, queues are a really good answer for an awful lot of things, um, except when the user's waiting to you know actually get a value and then the queue's not so interesting. Right. Yeah. And, and I think the bigger piece here, maybe this is this is fundamentally true of async await is. One of the pieces, reasons people resist queues is it's a very different architectural pattern. Mm-hmm. Like you don't, the only response back you get is I sent your message. So you have to have a separate response pipeline. I can think of ways that that works really well. And, um, you know, I've used MailChimp before. And MailChimp, when you kick off an ad camp, um, you know, an email campaign, or you're importing a list or something, it says your your task is, you know, your task has begun, we'll let you know when it's ready and when it's done, and you get an email. I mean, it's a simple idea, and I was satisfied knowing that, oh, this is going to take a while, That you know, this must be worthwhile doing, you know, it's not while you wait kind of thing. Well, I think Richard stated the key thing, which is we have a separate notification pipeline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I've done it where it dropped into the app in the little upper, you know, right corner. I did that with Node and um, did some, you know, I've done some other things with that. And email is certainly one tool. You can drop into some of the chat, if, you know, whatever the company is using. So, right. um, you know, it, it is just a separate notification pipeline. Right. And also it means that who is notified? Uh, is dependent on the outcome because if you start seeing if you see an error, then you obviously want to notify the user, but you also want to notify support and or your devs sure. so they can figure out what the heck is going on and get that one solved. 
my bigger concern here is that none of this stuff is trivial to implement. You've got an existing app that's got latency problems. People are complaining it's taking too long for whatever reason. You can't just drop in queuing. So you, you just touched on one of my pet peeves is that I absolutely go insane if somebody does that, makes that comment about uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. That makes me an insane person because mm-hmm. it is so wrong. It is It was stated about a very narrow scope and it's been used like across everything. Everything. If you have an existing application that has a, has a problem, has a latency problem, other than throwing money at servers, there is very little you can do. Right. And it, it's, it's just really, really hard. And if you have your logic isolated, you may be able to re- re-architect relatively inexpensively. But otherwise, you're probably looking at more money than the original app for a number of reasons, including it's harder to to get to 100% of current functionality than is to get to 75% and then evolve to 100%. And you can't do that when you're replacing an existing application. So if you don't think about these things up front and you don't make plans up front, you can't switch from sync to async with any degree of ease. Um, You know, it's you can't just like magic. You have to plan for, you know, you don't have to go crazy about it. And certainly there's business situations where you say, we'll deal with that problem when we get there because we can't afford to deal with it today. But if right. you don't, as a, as a programmer, you don't think about that, and you don't understand where your problems are likely to be, they're going to be really hard to unwind because, it, you know, a queue is even worse than async in a way to try to retrofit. It's really yeah. hard to do. Yeah. But they're both architectural changes. And I think yes. that's one of the tricky bits about async is you can fool yourself into just dropping it in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what? If, if you drop it in just right, you can be fine. But it's just if you mess it up, you're messed up. And, and yeah. that's the, you know, the thing is that you've got to, I, I think it's like, um, you know, I, I would not hesitate to, you know, listen to somebody who is super an expert, you know, about dropping it in and whether it was going to work or not. But, uh, you do have to have that full ability to put it top to bottom. And then you probably have to develop an entirely separate pipeline because you probably don't either don't want it everywhere or you, you can't afford to put it everywhere right now. But that shouldn't stop you from trying it. Well, I mean, that that's the whole idea of... Uh, of yeah, with A-B testing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you've got A-B testing, that's fine. You can definitely do that. Um, you know, I'd be interested to, to talk if anybody uh, out there listening um, has uh, has done that. They, they've set up A-B testing, they've dropped async in, and they found a, a, a significant improvement in their performance. I'd love to hear about mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Uh, because I just think that's a very interesting... It's a very interesting scenario and approach. Um, but... Uh, most people aren't set up for A-B testing. And then if they are set up for A-B testing, uh, they've got to keep tweaking this and, and probably not give up if it doesn't give them the performance they want the first time. Yep. Awesome. And all of that's against a backdrop of, you know, if you, if you're worried about all this stuff and you're worried about your long-term performance and your business changes, then it's probably worth going onto a platform uh, where it's only money, like an Azure platform or an AWS platform or something else, where mm-hmm. you're just going to scale out uh, pretty far before you have to do much, uh, much work on your architecture. So, Kathleen, what's next for you? What's in your inbox? Oh, wow. Well, I, I, I'm uh, setting up for this, this new workshop. That's a big job. It's a huge yeah. job to do a new workshop. I'm um, looking forward to you know, spring conferences. And by the way, I'm also going to NDC in, in uh, Oslo. So uh, okay. I'm going to be there as well. We'll be there too. Uh, yeah, we'll be there. The other thing that, the other thing I'm doing, which is, you know, kind of just out, kind of on the side right now, and I'm kind of trying to figure out its role is that there's a nonprofit coding school. And I did say that correctly. It's a nonprofit uh, coding school here in Denver that I just think the absolute world of. And so I'm speaking over there a little bit and, you know, so trying to support some things that they're doing. Uh, but I, I would love that to, you know, to see where that goes. Right now they're doing Ruby. Uh, and I would just like to say these, most of these programmers have already learned two languages. The second language they learned was generally on their own. Mm. So they're pretty hot. I mean, I have never met people that w- were walking out to their first programming job that had one tenth of what these people do. I mean, they've already had their first catastrophe. They've already, They've already had to collaborate at a level that you normally don't see people doing. They've already worked 60 hour weeks. They've already done yeah. so many different things because they're so passionate and want so badly to be programmers. And uh, there's just some amazing people that I know that it's hard to uptake a lot of Ruby programmers into Denver and a lot of these people will move. So if anybody's interested, they should look at Turing IO. They have some amazing hires that you can get out of there. Uh, I wouldn't say they're the cheapest on the planet, um, but it's, it's a really super high quality program and, 
I'm trying to see how we can maybe uh, carve some .NET into there, but I wouldn't redo their program in .NET because it's so good, even mm. though it's in Ruby. Mm. Uh, it's so good. I'd rather see about ways that maybe we can get some .NET layered in on top of that. At the very least, the the, the projects that they do at the end, starting to see some of those done in .NET. Um, very I'd love cool. to see that. Awesome. So, yeah. So, Turing.io? Uh, www.turing.io. Cool. So there's an alumni page there if anybody wants to find out more. And, you know, I just, I, I really want to shout out to, to Ryan and Jasmine because I just love both of them. They're, they're awesome. And, uh, they're still, you know, they're, they're looking for work right now. So, uh, so they're out there and they're both really great. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of other folks out there as well. Um, and, and just to, to, to be clear on this, um, I think enough of Turing that Turing took a whole lot of my money, uh, because I put my son through Turing. So, uh, <laughs> Nice. Uh, you know, there's a, yeah, I mean, I, I really believe in their program. And I'll tell you the truth. I went in and my attitude was, okay, the, the, the coding school will give him the paper and I'll teach him to code. And that was the way I went into mm. it. And two or three weeks in, he was hardly asking questions of me. He was so, uh, he was so engaged and learned so much and learned so much about how to learn that um, I just can't say enough good stuff about them. Very cool. Awesome. Well, Kathleen, thanks. It's always a pleasure listening to you talk about these things and in engaging with you. Come back again soon. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. All right. We'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC and Lama.